what are we talking about tonight, Mr. Aaron? So, um, for people who collect comic books, there's there's two big names in comic books. There, Marvel, and there's DC, and they continually have all of their properties turned into movies and they're huge blockbusters and they set sales records for their comics over and over and over. But much like there's Channel 9 and Channel 10 and Channel 7 and then there's SBS and the ABC, we're looking at the Channel 31 of comics, um, yep. the Gold Key comic collection. And these are a really interesting collection because there's a lot of fantastic licenses that are sort of, they mopped up the stuff that the other big comic companies didn't take. Jetsons, of course, was one of their uh, favourite ones. Jetsons was another big one, and I have had some Gold Key Jetsons comics, and they're usually quite good. When I said they fall into the trap of being very similar, the Jetsons, all of them, I think, they wear out the storylines really quick because they they find a formula that works, and it's usually, you know, Elroy gets into trouble with Rosie and they fix it, or George does something at work with uh, Spacely Sprocket and they fix it. And if you like that and you like the TV show, you're going to, you're going to think it's pretty cool, but can you have a hundred issues of the same recycled um, story over and over? No, they have a shelf life. So they are of their time. They're quite nice. I think they're quite well illustrated. The interesting thing as well is they're from that era where not everyone had color TVs. So some of the comics will yeah. jar quite badly because you look at the characters and you go, George Jetson shouldn't be in a red top or something like that. And it's probably because the people who were doing the illustrations only had black and white TVs and they didn't realise that the characters were fixed in every single episode. So again, with the Scooby-Doo ones, you have Shaggy in red and you're like, oh my goodness, he only ever wore green. What are they doing to my brain? You know, <laughs> and Star Trek had an amazing run with Gold Key. They went from the 60s all through the 70s. So they survived on the repeats um, when Star Trek went into syndication where the show itself didn't survive. And I guess Star Trek did so well because there obviously was a market for Star Trek that the TV um, executives didn't understand. And Gold Key picked up the franchise pretty cheaply and did a really good job of um, continuing the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Now, Gold Key kind of has a, a house style, particularly with the TV and movie shows, where the first couple of issues generally have production stills and photos from the actual show and then the longer the comic runs it changes over to the gold key sort of house um, illustrators and then you get the more psychedelic um, paintings and pictures and and drawings from that now you can see here here's the earlier issues um, now i've read a bit of the gold key star trek and they did a really faithful job on keeping the characters very much how they were in the tv show but they put them in situations either the tv show couldn't afford because of the budget of producing sci-fi on a tv budget or just didn't do because the comics were more psychedelic and had trippier stuff with ghosts and demons. And I think this came from having like house writers that were working on Twilight Zone and Ripley's Believe It or Not and Boris Karloff and Night Gallery and, and things like that. So when you recycle the stories on horror stuff, that's fine. But when you take some of those elements and try to put them in a sci-fi show, you get some totally weird shit in star trek and that's kind of good it's very of its time and you were mentioned earlier way back in the part of the discussion about the covers and i have to agree with you and we have covered this off before the covers for some of the star trek comics are almost like works of art unto themselves you can imagine if these were like posters there'd almost be like a collection of those available that people could put on their walls or whatever else and it would look really really good I do think the artwork really stands up from the period. Like, if you are a Star Trek fan, would you think these are amazing Star Trek pictures or are they just psychedelic art that they've stuck Star Trek in because it's the theme? Um, this is one of the things that you, you do see with Gold Key and their art. Um, they often have some really trippy stuff that looks more like the opening titles than the, to the Twilight Zone. And so you can see towards the end of the run where they have kind of ditched their house look and it looks just like a general comic from other stuff that was available mm. at the time. And I think that's a real shame because I do really like the, the artwork um, where every issue, the art is also um, generated generational yes um magnus robot fighter 4000 ad this is one of one of those things where you can see the the cover art is very similar to the star trek but it's magnus robot fighter and 
Magnus Robot Fighter, it's interesting because when I grew up, I knew Magnus Robot Fighter. He was a gold key comic, um, so I knew it kind of from that. And looking into it, I'm like, why has no one got the rights to this and made a series of movies or made a TV show? Because it's so relevant. And I think it would be very cool if they did the robots as they look in the comic, which is sort of those futuristic retro look, which I think would look stunning now. At the time, some of the stuff they were doing in the 60s is sort of so high concept. We've only kind of seen it in movies now. They had AI back then before there was a name for artificial intelligence and things like that and the whole, the almost the Skynet takeover before James Cameron did Terminator. And then you've got these very classic robots that are, are, are done by some of the great um, illustrators from gold key um and again they've got these amazing painted covers and then of course you have the cruder in internal drawings but if i was a kid you'd see those pieces of cover art and you'd go i'm in for a good comic if i if i read this so again here's some of the issues and you can see they they're usually again they fall into the re repetition of he goes into a city um fights some of the robot minions takes out the boss robot that's in charge of the city um Magnus has been fortified so he can basically punch up um, metal and steel. So he's a little bit like um, sort of robots of death. Absolutely. Which is a Doctor Who story. And you can see, um, you know, you've got your standard comic books inside. But I always think when you have like a such a hero painting on the front cover, it really helps bridge the imagination with the cruder art inside and get it across the line of something actually much better than it actually is. And there is a piece of Russ Manning artwork that I think sold for a couple of thousand dollars on the far uh, right there when I was looking to research this. So there are some original pieces of his art still around and you can get them from, from galleries. And I did wonder, I wonder if you got a piece of this and then they did make a movie of it. It would skyrocket in value getting, you know, an original Magnus robot fighter piece and again here's some of the other um comics with some of the futuristic robots i do think giant robots walking through the city a netflix series would be amazing um yeah. on the other side of the coin we discussed it earlier was a bit of the old twilight zone mr aaron yeah so um like i said i think i think they're very clever in that a lot of comics from the time you had like house of mystery and the ec comics that were doing horror and rather than just launching titles that sort of, you know, were cold to the public, if you got stuff like Twilight Zone or Ripley's Believe It or Not that already had that side sort of creepiness to it or weird stories, you could just use the same stories and and slap a picture of Rod Sterling at the sure. on the cover. And you've, and you've got the Twilight Zone comic when really it is just an anthology series of weird stories. I've got to say, though... Some of the Twilight Zone comics that I've read from Gold Key are just as good as the actual Twilight Zone episodes. They, Some of them don't have twists. They're just weird, weird stories. But some of them have really amazing, great twists to them that you could kind of go, well, this would have made a really good Twilight Zone episode. And it would actually encourage people to keep buying the comics because it's just something different every single time. So, uh, yeah, very clever. Yeah, so they did Twilight Zone. They did a huge run there and some, some weird stories and it was ufos and ghosts and demons and parallel dimensions and time slips and time travel and aliens and a whole lot of different stuff and they had some great writers where i think they also did this thing where some of them were adaptations of existing work or they might have even been stories that had been in like amazing stories from the 40s and 50s and then they'd got the rights and turned them into comic book versions and there's some more um twilight zone uh, comics there. The one I find interesting is the one on the right with the the big gun. I swear they've got like a publicity still from Land of the Giants. You've even got Steve mm. in the red jumpsuit kind of thing from a Land of the Giants episode. Um, they did do Land of the Giants comics as well, so there is that sort of connection uh, to it. But with the Twilight Zone, a lot of them are very pulp stories. If you ever find one mm. in an op shop or an old bookshop and it's cheap, I would recommend getting it and reading it. And of course, there's always an introduction by the host and like a wrap up by the host at the end just to make it a Twilight Zone comic. But they really could be any weird anthology comic, but it's got that added bonus of being a comic from the Twilight Zone. 
So you can see on the bottom left-hand corner, like the page of the comic, and it gives the impression it's printed on really cheap quality paper. Yeah, the gold key stuff is notorious. It is one of those things, if you open a box of comics, I can go, yeah, that sniffs, smells like gold key. The, the ink and the paper is very different. It's not as white, so it's very hard. Like, it's harder to find good condition ones because it is more cheaper paper. Um, so you're absolutely right there. Yeah, it's been unfortunate. The Invaders was another one of those um, shows that I never saw as a kid because they didn't repeat it. Um, and then when I was a teenager, they showed on the golden years of television. I thought this is an absolutely amazing show. Um, and of course, a lot of these things at the time, um, they were tried for gold key comics. And I think the Invaders gold key comics are particularly strong run, but it didn't take off. Um, but you can see by the covers, again, they hadn't got to the point where they ran out of publicity still, so started doing their own pictures. And if you collect, uh, I guess, sci-fi from the 60s, the Invaders isn't, there isn't a lot of it, but the Gold Key comics are one of those really amazing um, sort of collectibles from that series. And then they were very true, where they give the origin of the invaders and then they have some of the different stories and i remember reading one of them where you think the he's going to prove it because of course the invaders bodies disintegrate when they're killed so he always tries to show a policeman and the body's there and then they come back and the body's gone because it's disintegrated and i do remember um enjoying the comic because it was very evocative of the actual tv series and the covers are great you know so which is very cool. And speaking of very cool, that's actually the end of our part one.